hey, good morning, D.C. Church. I'm Pastor Cal. You don't know who I am, the pastor at this location. Pastor Ernie's out of town. He is, well, he's back in town, but he's still on vacation. I got that right. Yes. Yeah, so you'll hear him preach again next Sunday. But, but, you know, for now you're stuck with me. So uh, let's do this, right? So we're in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And so we are very good at church talking about Jesus as Lord, as Savior, as Messiah. But we're not always as good as talking about him as teacher. A person we should listen to and heed his words and put them into practice. That's the hardest part, right? You know, is the doing, right? Is the living out of your faith. And so this is very instructional. I hope it's instructional. And so we'll go to our... We'll go to the scripture now and to our Lord's words about how to live, okay? So Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, so the main idea of these passages, which may not seem to go together as you first hear them, but the main idea is you live to accumulate real wealth. A Christian, a person who follows God, should live to accumulate real wealth. Now, we'll unpack those terms because we know what live means. We know what accumulate means. But what is real wealth? What really matters? And so that's explained in the initial verses, right? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, right? And so more in Greek, in like an idiomatic, more uh, literal reading, it's more like don't make a treasure of earthly things, kind of like a bank has in it, has like a safe, and they hold on to what's in the bank. We hope they hold on to it, right? We hope so. And, or like a dragon is in his lair, his cave, her cave, you know, laying on the golden treasure, the, the hoard of wealth, and says, hey, I'm the dragon. If you go after my gold, I'm, I'm going to go after you, all right? So it's don't make a treasure, don't make a hoard of worldly, earthly things. Instead, make a treasure of, store up treasures of heavenly things, things that are related to God and who he is and what he wants for us. Earthly things, they're temporary. You know, they rot, they decay, someone can steal them away. You know, rats might eat them or nibble at them. They're not going to last. Heavenly things last beyond your life. They last beyond what uh, you, like whatever you do in your life, okay? So, live for lasting things. And then, where your treasure is, that your heart will be also. Now, this is kind of hard for us as moderns because we love to talk about what we believe and our values and not what we actually are doing. And what we do should flow from our beliefs and our values, right? And so you might hear someone say, well, don't judge me according to what I do. Judge me according to what I say I believe about the world. Let me give you an example, okay? I will embarrass myself to explain to you this truth, okay? I've been dieting, and I've lost some weight, okay? And I'm happy about that. I am pleased with my weight loss, and I have a little more to go. Some of you are looking at me and going, Cal, that's ridiculous. What could you lose? I want to get skinnier. But don't praise me, criticize me, and here's why. This is a two-part plan. I need to exercise. In particular, do cardio. I need to. It's the right thing to do. It's good for my heart. I know I need to do it. And I start, and I work out for a little while, and then I stop. And then I do it like one ride on the bike, and I'm like, this feels good. And then I don't do it again for like two weeks. And I cannot get started. I can't do it. And I know it's the right thing to do. I know I need to do it. I go to bed at night going, in the morning I'll wake up, and I'm going to ride the bike. I wake up, I don't ride the bike. I'm going to work in the morning. I say to myself, 
I'll get home from work, I'll write it in the early evening or later evening, and then I'll go to bed. I get home from work, I'm tired, you know, the kid's crazy or whatever, and so I have a reason why I don't ride the bike. So how can I possibly say I really make a treasure of exercise and cardio in particular. How can I say that? Because all of my behavior shows that doing cardio, exercising, is not where my heart is. I can say it's my treasure, but my heart says that's not true. And that's the point that Jesus is making. You look at your actions, your values, how you live your life, and all that together shows you what you value and what you care about. And right now, I'll be honest, I don't care about working out. I don't. I should, but I don't. I want to care, but I don't care. So this is my problem to figure out, and this is what he's saying here, okay? So you live to accumulate real wealth, but that requires understanding what is heavenly treasure, what is earthly treasure, and calling us all to go, be honest about yourselves, you know, what is your treasure, where is your heart? Be honest about your situation. Now, to the hard part. The eye is the lamp of the body. This is so weird to us, this is so weird, but in the ancient world, there was a prevailing belief that your eye was like an entrance into your soul for all kinds of stuff. So if you were like around bad stuff or people, if you were around disease and nasty stuff, it could like flow into you and make you unhealthy somehow. So the idea is Whatever your eye is looking at, it's like a lamp, and the lamp shines into your soul, and it will shine into you a good or healthy things, or it'll shine into you bad or dark things, the darkness. So Jesus co-ops, he takes this idea of like ancient medicine, and he gives it a spiritual perspective, and he says, what you look at, what you see with your eyes, or to go a little beyond that, what you hear, what you touch, what you smell, what your senses, what you bring into yourself, either shines into you light or darkness. Now, how do you shine into the darkness? Right? That makes no sense. The idea he's explaining is you either bring good stuff into your life or you bring bad stuff into your life. And so the stuff you look at, what you see, what you're around, what you experience, will affect who you are inside. That's what he's talking about. And if you're bringing in darkness in large amounts, you have that light shining into you, how great is that darkness? That's what he's talking about. Now, this is very important here. Very lastly, no one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. So you have a slave or you have a servant, they have a master. If you watch The Office, you've seen this, right? For a while, The Office had two managers, Michael and Jim, okay? And it didn't work out. It was a terrible idea because offices don't have two managers. They have one middle manager who loafs, not two. That's the way this works. No one laughed at that. Okay, it's fine, whatever. The point about this is you either serve God or you serve something else. Now, Jesus makes the point you cannot serve money and God or God and money. So the idea here is that money is very practical. We'll look at the metaphor because you go out in life, you work that job, you make that cash money, right? Then you go spend it on stuff you like, stuff you want to do. You can use the money to buy influence in your world, the praise of others. You can use the money to, uh, to go, like, look how strong and powerful I am. You can buy stuff, etc. So money is kind of like a way to explain our will and us being in control as opposed to God being in control. And Jesus clearly says you cannot both serve money or your personal desires and your will and God. Either God is the master or something else is. That's the only way that any of this works. So we ought to live to accumulate real wealth. Now, as we live, we want to live strategically, right? And to live strategically, you have to define, well, what are earthly treasures and what are heavenly treasures? And so I could make a long list of earthly treasures, but I don't want to do that. I want to speak about good and positive heavenly things, and you can fill in the gaps and go, what is the opposite of that? Okay? So what are some heavenly treasures? Well, here are the, the big ones, right? The gospel, the clear and basic Christian message that Jesus Christ did something special and unique on the cross when he gave his life for our sins. And when God raised him to life, that is the promise of life everlasting for all those who believe in Jesus. That is the gospel. Sin is a real problem. Everybody sins. It creates a brokenness and estrangement in between yourself and God. 
and your sins may not be my sins, but our sins all lead to the same result. We die both spiritually and in the body. That is the Christian message. Understanding God's Word, which I hope is happening right now. Understanding God's Word. The Bible is a unique and special book that God inspired the writers to speak about His truth, explaining that who God is, who humans are in relation to God, how the world works, how we ought to live, right? These are primary big truths that are heavenly treasures. Um, ideas related to, to who God is and his nature, right? So you know, say the uh, love, Christian love, forgiveness, patience, self-control, ideas that flow from God's nature that God wants us to have. These are really important things for us to have. And so you immerse yourself in the gospel, you immerse yourself in God's word, understanding God's word, you immerse yourself in God's principles, living how God wants you to live, and they become like a jeweled crown on your head or the, the nicest robes you could ever wear, you know? That's what heavenly treasures look like. But also more than that, institutions, things that God has made. So what has God made? Well, God made marriage, right? God made marriage. The unique love that a man and a wife share. So, married folks, you should work up and store this heavenly treasure of love in your marriage. You should strive to have a united, passionate, real marriage that contains romance, emotional, and physical romance. God made marriage, and it is good, and you should store up married treasures. The family, the family made by God, moms and dads, Make the effort to make your children the best they can be and give them the best chance to also be believers in Jesus by how you live and act, loving each other and loving them. And dads, I'm picking on you right now. Play with your kids. Play with your kids. Get on the floor and wrestle with them. Run around the house, do imaginary, all kinds of crazy stuff. Get off your phones. Get off the iPad. Make the step to invest in your children's lives, whether they're 2 years old or 8 years old or 24 or whatever. Make the step to be in their lives. Okay, so work. God made work. Work is not bad. The problem is, is when work is out of balance with how you ought to be living, right? So work for a purpose. Work in a way that helps your family, helps your life, helps your church, etc. See work for what it is and also see work for what it's not, which is your whole life. Real friendships. I'm picking on men again, okay? Real friendships where you invest in the lives of others and they invest in you. We humans are social creatures, and God made us to have real friendships. But this takes time. It costs something. And being a friend to someone means being involved in their life, having a say in what they're doing, and them having a say in what you're doing, right? So men, don't be isolated, alone creatures. Invest in real friendships. And finally, God's church. Invest in your church. This is not merely a money thing. I mean, of course, we want you to give. We need your offerings. But on a deeper level, I would argue, be a part of your church, connected to your church, understanding its mission and your place in that mission. When you open the Bible with other believers in a connect group, when you hold a baby in the nursery, or you stand by the door greeting people, you are doing something that actually matters eternally. You are speaking order and light into the darkness and the chaos of a dead world. How would you feel if, you know, we got the announcements going and like Jason's like, come to our PBS this year and help out or you can speak order and light into a dark world of chaos and void of emptiness. Would that sell well? I don't, I don't think so. But that's what's going on. When you stand for spiritual heavenly things, you stand in contrast to all the emptiness and the loss that is out there and the sin that is out there. So you want to live strategically. Think about heavenly treasures, map them out, and make the effort to plan and live for those things and not to live for the earthly treasures that will pass away. Okay, so the eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. Be careful what you put into your life. Watch out. Watch your eyes. Now, something really bad happened yesterday. An ex-president who's running for office again, someone tried to assassinate him, okay? And they almost were able to do that. And they killed someone in the crowd and wounded more, okay? And this is a terrible, awful, ungodly thing. Whether it's Joe Biden, our current president, or Trump, or anyone else running for office, or whoever, this is wrong, and this is not how we should act in this country. 
Instead, we should watch what we're taking into ourselves. And then we should watch, is there darkness inside of us? Are we seeking as Christians to find political solutions to spiritual problems? Do I have personal political beliefs? Absolutely. Do you have them? I'm sure that you do. And let's have respectful discussion, debate, but let's not get to violence, okay? This is what our Lord says in Matthew, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will see God. People of peace see God. Matthew 26, Jesus is being arrested unlawfully, extrajudicially for a kangaroo trial, which is totally unjust and unfair. He's being arrested, and Peter wants to defend against this, and he cuts a guy's ear off. And this is what our Lord says. Peter, you put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once have at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus is saying, I can bring to bear power and force beyond your wildest imagination. I can obliterate any foe immediately, and I am choosing not to do that. This is not the way. This is not what God called me to do. If you follow me, this is not what you were called to do. We are not here to make an earthly Christian kingdom. And lastly, John 18, Jesus is on trial with the Romans, and they're asking him questions, trying to figure out what is the crime this man committed. And this is what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is clearly saying that what I'm about, who I am, is about something way bigger than political, earthly realities. So we have to figure out, as, as Christians, how do we be peacemakers? How do we do this? So we think about that strategically, but also we need to watch out. What are we bringing into our lives? Are we watching media, discussing things that bring in desires for revenge, anger, frustrations that make our hearts really dark and when it comes to politics, very angry and toxic? Or are we praying for Biden, our president? Are we praying for Donald Trump? Are we asking for God to help this nation to work through these issues in a peaceful and like honorable way. So this is very important, and it wasn't in my original sermon, but I thought it just needs to be given what had happened, okay? So we want to live strategically, and we also want to realize the eyes, the lamp of the body. You want to live carefully, live carefully. Now, as you live carefully, it means you watch what you're putting into yourself because you realize what it can do to you. In a moment, we'll have a picture on the, the screens of a flag, it's a black flag with a red insignia. And what will you see on this black flag? Well, I see a flaming eye, a lidless eye, a watching eye. Yes, my friends, this is the flag, the banner of Mordor, ruled by the dark lord Sauron, who seeks to subjugate Middle Earth under his power and de dominion and authority and rule with malice and hate as a tyrant. And this was all, this was all created by a man named J.R.R. Tolkien. And T Tolkien wrote about Mordor, and this is what he wrote, okay? It's a dying place, but it's still sort of alive, but not really. In the middle is a volcano, and it's a plain all around it, right? And this plain is covered with ash. It has, it's just rich with a toxic fumes, f fire. It is a wasteland. It is an awful, terrible place. It's surrounded by mountains on three sides, isolated from the rest of the Middle Earth, and Sauron seeks to work for Mordor to destroy the world and bring it under his authority. Now, Tolkien, yes, he made this up, but he got it from his own life. You see, he grew up in England, and he was very close to the modern era where England developed, you know, coal mining, coal energy, manufacturing, heavy industry, and he saw the meadows and the farms and the woodlands of his youth be reduced down to um, just heavy industry, you know, smoke and ash and fire. And he saw the workers change from, you know, happy rural guys into like city men who, you know, there are some differences, right? He fought in World War I and on the Western Front with the Allies, and he saw trench warfare up close. He saw the mud and the lice and the disease and the cold and the death. He saw no man's land. 
he saw the destroyed trees and all the green was gone. And it was a, just a, like an empty scar in the ground where beautiful France once was. He saw all the death and he took it into himself and it affected him. But he used it in writing Lord of the Rings. And in doing so, he explained that when you pull this stuff into you, this evil and nasty stuff, it brutalizes you, it warps you, it changes you, and you become like Sauron or one of his orcs, unable to see the light and to understand how you were created to live. And for Tolkien, he saw men brutalized by war, if not killed, but warped and ruined by what they experienced. And he used that to explain a deep truth about reality. So what we ought to do is realize that what we see with our eyes, what our body experiences, is not morally neutral. It can bring into us really bad and dangerous things, and it creates in us a darkness, right? And so, you know, I know what's on TV and streaming. I know what's out there. Some of these shows, it's got really, really just negative stuff, emptiness, nihilistic, graphically violent. A lot of times, like, nudity is mixed in, you know. But you want to watch a show, so how do you watch this stuff? Well, my recommendation to you is to see the cost. When you watch these things and you aren't being critical about it, you're bringing darkness into yourself and it sticks to you and it changes you and it's not a good change and it's not what God wants for you. So you live carefully. You watch your eyes. You be very careful what you bring into your life and to your home. And lastly, because you live strategically, because you live carefully, you will live for God, right? You will live for God. When we see these words, and they're powerful words, that no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other, it sounds very dramatic, and it is. In Greek, a more literal reading is, you should not esteem anything over God. And when you do esteem it over God, you're making a mistake. And so it should be like anything opposed to God you should hate in comparison to your love for God. So, for example, I love my wife a great deal. Now, and I have, you know, I know women who are, who are my friends and we interact and stuff, but guess what? Compared to how I love my wife and know her, I hate all those women. I hate them. Now, I don't really hate you, but you get the idea. I hate you in comparison to how much I love her. And that's Jesus' emphasis. The way you love God should make you feel like you hate things that are not of God because you want to live for God because you see that by knowing God and obeying God and living for God, you can accumulate real and lasting wealth. And so that's the idea. So if you get one thing from this message this morning, know that I don't hate you, okay? Women, men, I don't hate you at all. I just, but compared to my wife, you aren't the same. And that's clear. Okay, so moving on. So live to accumulate real wealth, live strategically, live carefully, and then as a result, you live for God, serving him completely and wholly and fully. That is what God wants for you. And so I love the imagery of the lamp and the light and the dark, and it's a great way to think about life, that wherever you go and whatever you do, whatever you interact with, however it happens, you can either bring into yourself some darkness or some light. And that will either be God-honoring or it'll dishonor God. And beyond that, it's just not good for you to have all this nasty stuff in your life. And so what's going to happen now is I'm going to pray for us, okay? If you have any questions about Jesus' words here in Matthew 6, if you have any questions about what it means to be a Christian, I'll be up at the front while we sing. I want to talk to you, pray for you, and encourage you. Let's pray. Lord God, Paul writes to us in Philippians, he writes, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, and the God of peace will be with you. Help us, God, to see that we should live to accumulate real wealth. That starts by understanding the biggest treasure of all, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that for all those who turn from their sin and believe in Jesus, that they can have a new kind of life that begins the moment they believe, just based on who Jesus is and what he did for us. And God, I pray for everyone here that the 
they're able to see you want us to live in a different way, a better way. You want us to live strategically and carefully and to live for you because it is through you, God, that life can be changed. May we bring light into ourselves so that we can then shine light out and so that many others can see as well. And for anybody here who wants to speak to me, Lord, I'll be at the front and I want to pray with them and encourage them and help them to know about the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. I pray all these things in his name. Amen. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, and follow us on social media so you don't miss any future DC Church content.